Hello there. What is up? How are you guys doing? I hope you're having a great day. I am having a great day. It is Wednesday, September 26, 2018, and this this is the A Side Live Chat Podcast. My name is Sean O'Shadi, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it feels like a different world since the last time we talked. I think a, a few things have happened. Uh, John Jones, the man is back. Conor McGregor versus Khabib, that's off and running. UFC 230's main event, well, that's at least stayed the same. Nothing going on there, but I am sure we'll have a lot to talk about about that on today's show. But first things first, let me introduce my co-host here, my good friend. And to do that, I need to play another round of my favorite game. Where in the world is Mark Hermondi? Last week, he was coming at you from the MMA Fighting Sweatbox in New York. Mark, my man, where are you this week? It's somewhere new every week. I am in San Jose, California, the site of Bellator 206 on Saturday, uh, readying for fight week here in San Jose. A uh, big uh, Gegard Mousasi versus Rory McDonald, middleweight title fight, Vanderlei Silva versus Rampage Jackson. It's a big card for Bellator, and I'm here with, with uh, Esther Lynn and Casey Lydon, our, uh, our intrepid uh, video photo team. That is a very professional setup you have there. I see a dresser behind you. I yeah, see this, is our, this is the Airbnb that we're that we're staying at for for the week. Various accoutrements all around you is very nice. It's lovely. <laughs> hey, the lighting the lighting is good. The Wi Fi is good. That's all I can really ask for. Hey, that is really all that matters. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, well, man, that's fun stuff. You guys, Mark, and the whole MMA fighting team, Esther Casey. You guys are gonna bring us a ton of goodies from out there in San Jose this week. Uh, it's also bizarre to consider, but at this time next week, we'll both be in Las Vegas for McGregor, McGregor Khabib. Uh, that one seriously snuck up on me. I'm sure we'll have something special in store for you guys for that. Uh, can should you believe it? Uh, should we do a live in person the A side next week? That might be something. Do you, what do you guys think? Should we do can we, that? Can we Let do that? Know. That that's a that's a possibility because we will definitely be in Vegas. I genuinely can't believe that fight is next week. Can you? It's it, it's it's surreal that it's that it's so close. I should probably I should probably ask Casey. Right, he's a few feet away from me. If, if he's able to shoot the A side live, Casey, can you shoot the A side live next week on Wednesday? Yeah, as long, yeah, yeah, got it. All right, Casey, <laughs> Casey's Casey's giving us the go ahead. He's giving us the go ahead. We're good. We got live, the green light right. from Las Vegas. Uh. <laughs> it's amazing TV there. Amazing TV. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but hey, let's get going. As we always say, this is your guys' show. So we have a ton to talk about today, but we will talk about it in whatever way you want us to talk about it. We'll talk about anything, any topics you want us to talk about. You can ask us a question on the MMA Fighting page below. Uh, any question that gets three recommendations, those will turn green and get priority. Or you can ask us a Twitter on, or a question on Twitter using the hashtags, the A side chat rappers, uh, a replay of this podcast will be up immediately following the show on YouTube in an audio only version up on SoundCloud. And Hey man, with that, let's not waste any more time. Let's get going and jump into these questions. Are you ready? Mark? I was born ready, Sean. I like that. I like that enthusiasm. So first off coming from the MMA fighting webpage, loyal listener, the empire 91 wants to ask the question on everybody's mind right now, Mark. What the hell are they doing with UFC 230? He writes, everybody wants Nate Diaz versus Dustin Poirier as the main event. Why is the UFC so insistent on rejecting what their hardcore fan base wants? Also, why would Yoel get a title shot at 205? The UFC has pulled off some doozies in the past, but this latest thing or this latest thinking is asinine. That's a hell of a way to start, Mark. What do you think? It is the only way to start because we've been talking about the UFC 230 main event. This is our 12th show, right? Right, Sean? Our 12th? That sounds right. 12th show. I got to believe that like eight of the 12 shows we've talked about what the hell the UFC 230 main event is going to be. And now it is late September. <laughs> MSG is November 3rd. Tickets go on sale for this card on Friday. And we're still asking the same question. What the hell is going to be? The UFC 230 main event. So let, let's let's break it down. So last night, and we've been talking about this, the Nate Diaz versus Dustin Poirier fight is is was slotted as the co-main event. It's a non-title fight. The people's main event, if we're being honest. 
you have you have you have been a a huge proponent of this being the main event, and you have been. I will give you credit for for weeks now. You've been saying this for weeks that you should give you should give uh, that the UFC should give Nate Diaz and Dustin Poirier the ball, let them run with it as the main event. So in in the in the in the last few days, what you have been saying for weeks has been kind of bubbling up below the surface uh, to to a point where Nate Diaz and Dustin Poirier now are both tweeting that that well they're saying they are the main <laughs> event and it's for the new 165 pound title i don't think that's completely accurate what they're saying because that dana white has has denied that to, to you uh to, to brett okamoto of espn uh so that may not be true but they are trying to get that main event they're trying to get that new 165 pound title and, and that's what they're trying to get but it doesn't seem like the ufc is biting just yet Again, tickets go on sale in two days. I believe tickets go on sale today for uh, like pre-sale. Yeah. Um, Ariel Hawani, our, our 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 friend and, and former colleague at MMA Fighting, now he's at ESPN. He reported this morning that the UFC is talking about doing a an interim or a title fight between Yoel Romero and Alexander Gustafsson for the light heavyweight, the light heavyweight interim or 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 undisputed title, whatever. What which means Daniel Cormier would need to be stripped. It's a very weird fight. And I see you on the other you no one can see this, but Sean, you look exasperated by this. You're putting you're putting your hands behind your head. <laughs> uh, you're not you're not you're not liking this uh, uh, Gustafsson Romero matchup very much. But that that is the latest. And I would imagine that would be the main event. Although I would I would argue that that a Diaz Poirier title fight at 165 would be a would be a bigger fight would be a bigger draw it's the whole thing is very weird and it seems like the ufc is is kind of grasping for straws they're trying to force something that maybe is not there when they have the diaz poirier fight right there like like you've been saying all along yeah i mean so i'll start at the top because the the yoel romero versus gustafson fight that was what was it uh reported today by ariel like you said i definitely do not have a problem with that fight that's a great fight I would love to see that fight. I feel like that's a fight we have asked for on this show, just in general, to see Yoel go up to 205, make his mark there in that division, start a new journey there in that division, and start really with the top contender, Alexander Gustafson. That sounds great. That just is not... That's so... That is such a silly way to handle this situation. That is not a main event uh, that feels very thrown together. That That's fine for a fight night or something of that magnitude. That is not an, an interim title fight with Yoel Romero and Alexander Gustafson at the last second. What are we doing here at this point? What are what are we doing here? Yoel Romero withdrew from this card just over a month ago due to a li lingering eye injury that his doctor said he couldn't fight. If you're Paolo Costa right now, how are you feeling? I'm sure he is very upset just to even hear this. Since Alexander Gustafson's last fight, Yoel Romero has fought in three championship fights Two of them, he missed weight. At this point, we're just giving these title shots away so willy-nilly that it's, it, it makes no sense, man. You're just cr giving people opportunities over and over again despite them, them not fulfilling their obligations in terms of the missing weight. If Yoel Romero wants to go to 205, that's great. He can't come up there for an immediate title shot, man, and especially not at the last second, not to headline a show at MSG like this. That doesn't make any sense. Yoel Romero has headlined three pay-per-views over the last two years. They sold 130K in terms of pay-per-view buys reported from our own David Meltzer. 130K, 130K, and 250K. Those are not great numbers by any stretch of the imagination. Alexander Gustafson's one pay-per-view that he headlined outside of John Jones, that sold 250K. You have a guy in the that who in his last two fights were the fought in the two biggest pay-per-views of all time. And you're going with guys who have struggled to scratch 260K rather than just rolling the dice on him and seeing if you have something there. In the words of our forefather for this show, that is mal promotional malpractice. Let me just say one thing. Of course, uh, Nate Diaz was facing Conor McGregor in, in those two fights. Uh, as we all Conor know. McGregor was not selling those numbers with Eddie Alvarez or Jose Aldo or whoever you want to throw in there, man. It takes two to tango, and there was something about Nate Diaz that the public loved, that the public uh, embraced, that the public wanted to see more of. And I've already gone over this over and over and over again for weeks. 
But I believe they the UFC has botched the way that they reintroduced Nate Diaz into this whole equation. They could have made it bigger. They could have made it a big deal. Right now, it doesn't feel like it's a big deal. But last night, it felt like a big deal again. When Nate, first of all, let me interrupt my own little rant here to say that I love that Nate Diaz and Dustin Poirier are are basically turning the tables on the UFC and using their own tactic against them. Because the UFC always does this, where they introduce a fight, they announce a fight that's not actually booked. And it's just a way to like publicly pressure fighters to accept that fight. Now it's just Nate Diaz and Dustin doing the exact same thing, tag teaming, working towards a common goal. I love that. And you know what I noticed though, man? Very little, if any, complaints from a fan base very, very willing and ready to complain whenever something doesn't sit right with them. When that when they were going on about that last night, about the 165 pound division. Were you seeing much complaints? Because I was seeing just people being happy about it. I was seeing people being excited about the idea. That's two fan favorites in a fight that deserves to be five rounds, a fight that needs to be five rounds, in a division that feels inevitable at this point. How many times have we seen this year already the UFC's need for more belts lead them to do ridiculous things and make super short-sighted decisions like what we may even see coming up? The talent pool is there at 155 and 170 to split up. I get the resistance. 170 is a legacy division, and Dana White is nothing if not a, a creature of habit. Uh, his, in, his insistence on keeping face the pain over repeated and multiple attempts from many, many, many parties to change that can attest to that. But even if you just think about this in a very base way, like just on a pure money way, like in a way that really makes sense for someone trying to make as much money as possible. If you introduce a 165 pound division, that gives you a possibility where after Connor Khabib, if Connor wins, what's he going to want to do? He's going to want to go up to that 165 pound division and fight for a third belt. You can make more money. You get more Connor McGregor fights at a base level. That's at least something that I would think the UFC could understand. There are so many positives to this. I just do not understand why they don't do it. If you have to give me the choice between a new title, a, a 165 pound division, with Nate Diaz and Dustin Poirier fighting for that title in the MSG main event, or Romero versus Gustafsson for some kind of light heavyweight title, I am I am with you. I am I am down for for Diaz Poirier. I've I've come around. I'm ready. I'm ready to drink the Kool Aid. I'm, oh, I'm with you on this God. one. I I will say a few, a few oh, other things. It feels so this. good to be right. Fine. It's 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 taken a long time because I re I I always thought the UFC had something up their sleeve. I always thought it was going to be a John Jones. It yeah. was going to be a Woodley. It was going to be a GSP. I always thought they had something, and I thought I really thought all along it was going to be John Jones. Honestly, I really did, and I'm still I'm still not convinced it's not. Until it's not, I won't I think it's not. But it doesn't it doesn't seem it seems more and more as as the hours and the days go by that. John Jones is not walking through that door at, uh, at Madison Square Garden on November 3rd. One more thing about Romero, and, and yes, he, he said he was not able to fight Paulo Costa because of the orbital injury uh, sustained in the Whitaker fight back in July, but uh, in, in June, I should say. But I can't blame him for trying to get back oh, earlier yeah. for a title fight. People yeah, are criticizing, like, oh, what would Paulo Costa? I mean, look, I think Paulo Costa is going to be great. But who is Paulo Costa at this point? If, if Romero has a chance at a title for more money, of course he's going to try to come back earlier for that rather sure. than a Paulo Costa mid-card type, type matchup. So I don't, I don't blame that, that at all. I mean, if, if the UFC is offering, of course yeah. they're going to take. But I think the UFC – if, if they want to do Romero, Gustafsson as, as a three-round co-main event, no title, and put, and put Diaz versus Poirier as the main event for the new 165-pound belt, all for it. But I don't think – I don't think Romero uh, Gustafsson is a bigger fight than Diaz versus Poirier. It's not. It's just not. Like if, if on any given metric you could look at it, it's not. Uh, and it, it's it's ridiculous. And I just want to take this moment to enjoy you telling me that I'm right. I'm going to bathe in it a little bit. I'm going to cut that clip out and play it on repeat because you have been arguing with me for weeks about this. For weeks. And the people have been telling you that you're wrong. And finally, you're coming around. Uh, but I, I agree with you, man. The whole time we thought Tyron Woodley versus Colby Covington, that was a, that was one that potentially could have gone there. And then John Jones. And I agree with you. I think there's still a chance that John Jones could slip in this in the last second, especially given what's going on gone on the past week. But otherwise, man, what are we doing here? If you I if you like you said.
throw Yoel Romero Gustafson, which is an amazing fight. I would I love that fight. And like you, I do not begrudge any either of them for taking this opportunity. When the UFC calls with this opportunity, you have to take it. But if you throw that as the co-main event to that card, that's one of the most stacked cards of the year, man. That is one of the most stacked cards of the year. Just roll with it. You have it there already. I do not understand this. One one more thing about this, too. Let's say they do Gustafsson against Romero, November 3rd in MSG. So you have John Jones, who maybe is not ready for that card, but can come back and possibly fight on the year-end card. Then who do you have him fight? It seems like Jones, Gustafsson made sense yeah. for either an interim light heavyweight title or maybe they take the belt off DC and they and they put that up for the grabs uh, for grabs in that fight. So let's say you do Gustafsson in November. He won't be ready again in late December, uh, December 29th for UFC 232. So what so what are we doing with John Jones then? John Jones doesn't have a fight for December unless DC is going to cut down to 205 one more time, fight Jones again, and then try to fight Brock Lesnar at heavyweight before March. That seems it seems like the timing there is all wrong. And 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 then what do you do with John Jones? Do you have something else up your sleeve for John Jones? So it's, this is the same kind of thing that's been happening where the UFC has a spot to fill on a card. They need to force a matchup that will pay dividends later in a bad way. It'll, it'll force them to kind of, instead, instead of having like a, co, a, a kind of a coherent plan, a, a flow to the year schedule, fights getting made that make sense, you got to force one into a, into a spot, a, a square into a, into a circle hole, and then it, it affects main events in the next over the, the next few months and, and that's kind of what would happen here if they put if they put alexander on that card i think yeah i man and it, it's I, i'll repeat myself it, it is the ufc making repeated short-sighted decisions because of like you said this need to fill the schedule and we how many times have we seen this already this year how many instances could we point to where this has been a thing where they have had to make like you said these decisions that have ramifications down the line just because they need a belt on the line i do not understand why you don't just introduce the 165 pound division move 70 up to 75 helps everybody you have an extra belt you have it all there I, i'm repeating myself at this point but it's just exasperating i don't know how what else to say about it so i guess should we move on or do you have anything to add no i, I think we can move on the next question is is about the same kind of it's about the same topic it's a little different uh it's from uh nae 87 from the mma fighting comments uh for the sake of argument let's say that nate and dustin are telling the truth and the ufc 230 main event is for a new 165 pound title if that's the case two questions come to mind one ostensibly this would be just a transparent attempt to juice the pay-per-view numbers by hoping to benefit from whatever percentage increase in buys a title fight brings but there have been calls for a 165 pound division to bridge the 15 pound gap between 155 and 170. So is this the right thing for the wrong reason? Two, if this were to happen, wouldn't the logical thing to be to eliminate 170 and add 175 so that now divisions were every 10 pounds up to 185? I'll, I'll just say one thing about this uh, because we kind of touched on a lot of this already. The, the 170 to 175 thing is a question that I've been getting a lot. If they add 165, does that mean that they have to move the 170 to 175? And I know from talking to people that the UFC has been resistant to changing that 170 division because they feel like that is a that is a hallmark franchise division for them yeah. in the UFC for, for the last X amount of years because of that lineage with the Matt Hughes's and the George St. Pierre's. And it's been a, uh, you know, BJ Penn, of course, has, has competed in that division as well. I've been the champion of that division. Uh, that is one of their uh, one of their kind of pillar divisions, and they don't want to move it uh, from uh, 170 to 175 because it would kind of change, I guess, that historical lineage. But, again, I mean, I, I don't know if that matters so much in the end. I do understand that thinking because that has been kind of one of their – uh, premier divisions uh, historically some of the greatest fighters in UFC history have competed there uh wh- what do you think is is, is, it, is it worth kind of mortgaging that that history and, and moving on or or do you think they should kind of hold on to that I mean at a certain point tradition is great but the sport has changed we I, I again I feel like I'm repeating myself but these divisions 55 and 70 at this point are 30 deep with just killers they're, it, they are by far the deepest divisions in the entire sport you could split these up three and have very stacked divisions still. I understand, again, that it is a legacy division that George St. Pierre and Matt Hughes and all of these guys competed at this place. 
but the gladiator was part of the UFC for a little bit. Face the pain is part of the UFC. Like at a certain point, things evolve and things change. It is a different sport now with a lot more talent, a lot more participation, uh, and just a generally a lot more world-class top tier athletes than it was back then. And we also know a lot more now about weight cutting and in this and you know the the negatives of it and what it can do to people and how it affects people in the fight, what it what it means to go into a fight so dehydrated. We know more about that now. Holding on to some traditions just because that's what we've always done is usually how you can start to, to mess things up, how things can go awry if you see a better route. I'm just saying. Oh, Mark, I think your, your mic is muted. This is the wonders of live TV. You're right. It was. There you go. I, I didn't really have anything important to say anyway. So, so no, I, I, will, I was saying that I, that I do, that I do agree with you. And, and I think it's the ABC, the, the association of boxing commissions and combative sports has already added these new weight classes. They're available for the UFC to take anytime they want. It's up to the promotion to add them, uh, you know, themselves. They're already there. They, they can add 165. They can add 175. It's not out of the question. They can do it tomorrow if they want. It's just a matter of whether they're going to pull the trigger or not. I think 165 as a division is a no-brainer. I think there are plenty of athletes who can move up to 165 from 155, live a much healthier, comfortable lifestyle, cut a much more reasonable amount of weight, make that weight safely, and be better fighters in that weight class. I'm talking about guys like Kevin Lee, like James Vick. I mean, there are a number of fighters. You can even say a Habib Nurmagomedov. So, uh, there, there are a number of guys who can move from 55 to 65 and and I mean even at 172 you have Rafael Dos Anjos you have a bunch of guys who who would fit in that 65 category I don't want to see I don't want to see a a mass exodus of 170 down to 165 I I would hope that cooler heads would prevail and then they're they're not trying to make even tougher weight cuts but someone like Dos Anjos who we know was a 155er he he's a shorter guy he can make 165 I'm sure without a problem someone like a, cow a cowboy Cerrone I think uh, that could be perfect division rejuvenate cowboy Cerrone's career going to 165 because maybe he's a little bit too small for 170 he he cuts a good amount of weight for 155 it's a little bit too much that's a nice sweet spot in the middle there for uh, you know a late career renaissance for for Cowboy. I mean, there's, there's, a lot, there's a ton of possibilities. There's so much talent in those two divisions. They're the two most stacked divisions <laughs> in the UFC. <laughs> I, I feel like we're just repeating ourselves. So my final word on this that I will say is in response to the question from NAE, NAE, that's hard to say, 87, is that, is this the right thing for the wrong reason? I would say, yes, it is the right thing for the wrong reason to introduce this 65 pound division now. But a lot of things are done in this sport, especially these days, for the wrong reason, basically because they're forced into happening. And if this would be one of those instances where maybe the right thing is happening just because it's time and circumstance and it's the wrong reason, that's fine with me. Uh, but let's move on. Let's talk about why you're in San Jose right now. This question comes from Dizzy Dorf, loyal listener, who asks about Musasi versus McDonald. And I cannot wait about this fight. He asks, how do you see this fight playing out? What are Rory's keys to victory? Thoughts on the rest of the main card for Bellator 206, Mark? I mean, I, I, I am very excited for this card, as I said at the top. I think that this is a, a – Chuck Mendenhall tweeted that that Musasi Mendenhall uh, – Musasi Mendenhall – Musasi Mendenhall – Now, McDonald's that's the fight the, I want to see. I, I, would, I would probably watch that. I would probably watch Musasi Mendenhall. There are a lot of M's going on here. Uh, Chuck tweeted that it's the, it's the MMA equivalent of an art house film kind of like this this independent uh type thing where it's it's two guys who you never really knew you wanted to fight each other and now that the fight is booked you're you can't wait to see what could possibly happen uh, musasi is a top certainly a top five middleweight in the world i don't think anyone would dispute that at this point right we don't know exactly where where to put him he could be a top three yeah he's up there he's up there certainly like if you if you said robert whitaker versus gegard musasi that's not i mean you would you would scratch your, your chin and say i'm not really sure who would win that fight yeah and then you have rory mcdonald's who has a win over ufc welterweight champion tyron woodley so you know rory mcdonald is also among the top three to five welterweights in the world and they're meeting in a super fight in bellator mcdonald is the welterweight champion there musasi is the middleweight champion there let me let me ask you really quickly because you're there you're on the ground 
Do you feel like this is the biggest fight in Bellator history? I think that in terms of relevance and merit, it is the biggest fight in Bellator history because of where those guys stand in the world. And it's indisputable. In in the past, Bellator has had great fighters. I mean, we know we know how good those those fighters uh, have been. The Eddie Alvarez, the Michael Chandlers, the Patricio Pipples. We know how good they are. But with McDonald and Musasi, we have the that that common competition with the top fighters in the UFC. So we actually have the maybe it's MMA math, you might call it, but we know how good those guys are in their respective divisions in the world because we've seen it. We've seen them perform at that level in UFC main events. And not to not to not Bellator, but UFC is still the standard bearer. And we've seen how both those guys have done. And to have them fight each other, I think it is it is a it is a massive fight for Bellator. I, I really think that in terms of having it's it's two of the best fighters in Bellator history in terms of their of their relevance in the division and they're fighting each other. So therefore I believe it is it is the biggest fight in terms of in terms of relevance in Bellator history. As as far as as how it will play out, that's a very interesting question. It's a very interesting question. You have to wonder how much the size advantage will be for Musasi, a guy who fought a good amount of his career at 205 pounds and McDonald is moving up to 185 from 170 to take this fight. Now Rory is not a small guy by any stretch of the imagination. But I do think that in his game, and if you watch the the last fight against Douglas Lehman when he won the Beltor title, a big part of his game is the ground game, is the wrestling. Will he be able to get Musasi down into? And when we've seen Musasi struggle on his back at times, when he's put on his back, he has a hard time uh, in, in in previous fights. So that could be a key for Rory. But stand stand up. It's, if it's a stand up fight, I don't know. It's it, Musasi probably have a, a bit of a reach advantage, but. It is uh, it is a fascinating uh, stand up matchup. I think that McDonald has the has the advantage maybe in the wrestling. Musasi maybe has a slight grappling advantage, but the stand up, not really sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say I, it, it's unfortunate because I feel like there's not enough buzz for a fight of this magnitude. I mean, I agree with you. I think this is basically the biggest fight that Bellator could put on right now, and and maybe the biggest fight in Bellator history. Eddie Alvarez, Michael Chandler would probably be in there as well. Uh, but it feels like there's a significant lack of buzz. And I know also we're not getting a press conference, which kind of sucks because both these guys are very interesting characters. And also you'd probably have Vandalay and Rampage there. You could get some fun back and forth there. I'm kind of confused as to why that's happening. But, you know, I, I, I talked to both of these guys, Musasi and McDonald, uh, in the past week or so. And they are both just so interesting characters in their own way. And I feel like they're both really hitting their stride and just in terms of letting you in, letting people know about their personalities, letting, letting their personalities show. Uh, and it's in, this interest is an interesting matchup to me because it is also an inverse, I think, of what both of these guys are used to. Uh, Musasi is always, always used to being the smaller man. Like if you look, if you think about what he, where he's been, if you look at the fights he's been had in the past, he used to fight at light heavyweight. He was even a heavyweight in Japan. I mean, the, the man subbed Mark Hunt, for God's sake. Uh, and he told me that this is the first time he can remember in a combat sports career that probably spans 15 years and nearly 100 fights in various ways that he will have an actual noticeable size advantage over his opponent, uh, which is a foreign thing entirely to him. So I'm fascinated to see how he uses that. Is he going to be the bully for once in regards to size and strength and things like that? And Rory, on the other hand, like you said, Rory's a massive welterweight, man. Like he has almost always had the size advantage over, over opponents at 170. He's told me he's gained some muscle with some a powerlifting routine. He's really enjoy, enjoyed and embraced since he fought Douglas Lima. He's also kind of learned lessons from George St. Pierre uh, of just not trying to overdo it in terms of gaining size, because we know what that what that how that affected George. Uh, also, I mean, Rory just has to fight multiple times at 170 in a few months in this tournament coming up. So he kind of can't put on a lot of size for this. Uh, but like you said, man, the most interesting part of this to me is the way that their skills overlap each other in so many ways. It is such an intriguing fighter because neither one really has a super discernible edge over the other in terms of skill set. Like both are so well-rounded, active, long, dynamic. Strikers who can use all eight weapons really, really effectively. Strong clinch games, super formidable on the ground. And again, man, we've said this in weeks past, but there's a compelling case. You said that 
they could be the top three fighters in their weight class. There's a compelling case. They're number one in their weight class, just given their resumes. So also, you know, one thing that stuck out to me with Gegard and talking to him is that he sees the end coming. Uh, he talked a lot about retirement with me without me even asking. He just kind of brought it up and talked a lot about it, how he only has a few fights left and he just wants to kind of have a fun end to his career. Uh, so this really could be the, the start of a final chapter for him. So we should enjoy it while we can. I, I'm really looking forward to this week. Uh, and that fight is going to be ridiculous off the off just fireworks uh, 100%. And also that the rest of that card to answer, I guess, the rest of this question, Lima Koreshkov kicking off that welterweight tournament. That's going to be good. Also, though, Aaron Pico taking on Leandro Higo, man, a former title challenger at Bantamweight. They are just throwing him into the deep end, man. They that, is, just, that, is no cup, that is no cupcake. That is no showcase fight for dude, Aaron Pico. Showcase is, fights are over. That's, that that's is, the deep end. He, he didn't even really get showcase fights. He's been fighting dudes who have so much more experience than him. And then now, now you're just throwing him against Leandro Higo. Like he, that kid is unafraid, man. I am really looking forward to see how he handles that a challenge of that magnitude because that could really be it. If he beats Higo, he's right there in the top contenders in this division, and we could start seeing some really crazy matchups with him. I would say, and, and people ask about, is Musashi McDonald the best fight in Bellator history? You can make the case that this card is among the best in Bellator history, top to bottom. It's a really interesting, well-rounded card. Also, Carrie Melendez, of course, uh, coming back, and she's kind of a... Uh, I mean, it's hard to say a prospect because she's in her 30s, but she's looked incredibly impressive in, in this kind of new career. She was a kickboxer, Muay Thai fighter. Now she's now she's doing MMA, and she's looked. She has like one one punch knockout power at 115 pounds, which is rare in this sport. And I feel like Bellator is kind of hitting its stride right now. They have the DAZN deal in place. In two weeks, we're we're gonna be in New York for those two back to back cars with the heavyweight World Grand Prix. Shale Sonnen versus Fedor Emelianenko will be, I think, a, a big drawing fight for them on Long Island in two weeks. It's almost unfortunate that these two big these two big weeks for Bellator are bookending the Habib McGregor card, the UFC 229 next week in Vegas. I feel like if that wasn't happening, there would be a lot more buzz for the Musasi McDonald, for the Fedor Chael. But there's still time. It's only Wednesday. We'll see if the buzz grows here in San Jose as the week goes on. Yeah, uh, very much so. And one thing I want to throw in there before we move on to a different topic entirely, we just got a tweet from, from Dim Space, who, who does fantastic work on Twitter. Uh, and this is revisiting what we were talking about with UFC 230. Kind of, he, he basically tweeted us a list. Uh, you can check it under the chat rappers hashtag of all the, the fighters, the number of fighters per division uh, in the UFC. And lightweight and welterweight has 91 and 92 fighters respectively in it. All the rest of them have about 50 40 30 uh featherweight has like 78 but other than that lightweight and welterweight have so many more fighters than the rest of the division uh than the rest of the divisions there is so much room there to split those three up i know that was completely derailing it but i i those numbers are astounding to me uh but let's move on and and there's no i mean anecdotally it seems like there there is an obvious room for a third division there. And also it seems like statistically as well, if you, if you look at those numbers. Yeah. So let's move on. Uh, this one's a tough story for, uh, from Jay Tiller Jr. Uh, and unfortunately, it seems like we're getting a lot of these stories this year. Uh, he writes, how did the UFC allow Abdul Razak Al-Hassan to fight at UFC 228 when he was free on bond for sexual assault, uh, in parentheses, assuming they knew, but they should, right? Uh, so Mark, I know you've been working on this story this morning. Um, just give me, I guess, your general thoughts on, on what's going on and the information you have. Yeah, so to, to dial it back a little bit, Abdul Razak Al-Hassan, who is a UFC welterweight, was arrested in April um, stemming from uh, alleged rapes um, in, in March. I guess uh, the story is, which is what uh, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram has reported, um, he, was, he was indicted on Monday on these two counts of sexual assault and we, we just saw him. We just saw him in Dallas a few weeks ago, UFC 228. He knocked out Nico Price in the first round. And uh, I guess the question from, from the commenter there is how could the UFC let him fight if they knew? I don't know if they knew. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I've reached out to the UFC this morning, have not gotten a response yet. Still, still kind of working on, on this story. Uh, you know, I, I have not, I've not received the arrest affidavit yet. But according to the Fort Worth uh, Star-Telegram story, he, he's ba basically, he, he was a bouncer at a bar. He allegedly met two women at a bar. Uh, 
one night in March. I guess they, they got drunk. He allegedly drove them home. And and according to the prosecution, he ra he raped both of them at, at one of their homes. So that that is the accusation. Of course, we have no idea what happened. Everything's alleged right now. Innocent until proven guilty. I did briefly speak to Mr. Al Hassan's lawyer this morning, uh, Brandon Barnett, out, out of the Fort Worth, Dallas area. And uh, he told me that Al Hassan plans to plead not guilty, and and they're going to you know fo follow this this through. And uh, they're they're mounting a defense, and and they they firmly believe that that this is not true. You know that that that, that you know the accusations are not true, and and that's pretty much uh, you know all, all he told me this morning. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that that's that's pretty much what we know at this point. Uh, I'm still working on uh, on an actual print article. Hopefully, we'll have that out later today. Just waiting on a few things to uh, to, to come to me. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's obviously a super sensitive story. It's uh, it's a tough one. You know, it's it's a hard one to read if you go back and look at that that Fort Worth Star Telegram story. Some of the details, some of the allegations. Uh, again, don't know if they're if they're true or not. But that w what's out there is uh, is kind of disturbing. Yeah, and this is one of those things where it would be irresponsible to comment on it without knowing the actual facts without waiting for this process to play out. I mean, we just saw this with Nick Diaz. Uh, you, if you rush to judgment, obviously, we don't know what could happen in the future. You don't want to do that. But it's unfortunate, man. It's an unfortunate story, and it's certainly something we'll monitor moving forward. Also, I, I just will add, uh, again, we don't know if the UFC knew uh, about this going on. But I would imagine if they did, they certainly wouldn't have let him fight. They, they may, We may criticize them for a lot of things. But in regards to track records like this and situations like that, they usually make the right decision and don't allow fighters to fight when something like this is going on. If they if they didn't know at the time and they're only finding out now, I can imagine they're probably furious. Yes, so that that's a, that's one of the things where I think they they always tell fighters if something happens, you gotta at least let us know so that there's not egg on our face later. So if they're just finding this out this week. I can imagine them being uh, being upset. The whole the whole thing is is it's it's just it's a uh, it's a horrible story to hear. We, again, we don't know how it's going to to play out. But Al Hassan is a guy that just a few weeks ago we were talking about being, you know, a real up and coming guy in the welterweight division. He has three first round knockouts in a row. Four of his last five, he's won by knockout. He seems like a guy that that could make waves in the divisions. Got I mean, we obviously know about his uh, his his knockout power. So it's uh. It's it's something that you, you hate to see. It was uh that was a a hard thing to see to, to read uh, last night when uh, when that news came out in the the Star Telegram from uh, Fort Worth. Yeah. Uh, so hey, let's move on. Uh, next question is coming from Roto John, who goes back to the UFC 230 discussion with the rumored Gus vs. Yoel 200 pound title fight or 205 pound title fight for the UFC 30, 230 main event. I can't even speak today. Uh, does this mean that we have seen the last of DC at light heavyweight? Uh, and so I will add to this before I even ask this, that fight is obviously not fit, not official. That fight is not even done yet. Like we don't even know if that's what the fight is. So it's still very much in the works, but I will just preliminary say, if that's what ends up happening, I'm sure we don't see DC at two five again. And I think that's the right call. Yeah, I think, I don't think DC should go to two Oh five again. It's just, it's just, rolling the dice on losing that Lesnar fight. If he really is going to retire when he turns 40 next March, it's going to be very difficult for him to fight at 205. Plus he still has a hand injury. Let's not forget that. Still got a hand injury from the Stipe fight that, he, that he's dealing with. I don't know if he can get down to 205 sometime in the next few months, then turn around and fight Brock Lesnar again early next year and still retire by March, 2019. It just doesn't seem realistic to me a few maybe you know a few weeks ago a few months ago if you if you said maybe dc could be ready for msg november there's a few there's a few months maybe he can take the brock fight in in, or in march or february that's within the realm of possibility but now as we're, as we're getting closer just doesn't seem like dc is going to 205 and i don't think he should i mean that brock fight is there for him it's a lot of money he can make it's it's uh it's not like a legacy fight the way that a steep a or a jones would be but it's a big fight it's one that's going to get a lot of attention and we all know DC is a huge pro wrestling fan, so that would be kind of a feather in his cap. And and maybe we see him in uh, in WWE in some uh, in some way, shape, or form uh, down the road as well. I'm sure we'll all love that. That's I mean, I would I wouldn't be upset. He has the mic skills. <laughs> he can get it done. He can get it done. All right. Well, hey, let's move on. What's next? Uh, from the MMA fighting comments, Hefe uh, O One. 
165 pound weight class is a mistake. Weight classes are range, not simply a number, i.e. flyweight is anything up to 125 pounds. Lightweight is 146 to 155. Welterweight is 156 to 170. Simply put, adding a t number like 165, 220, et cetera, would not solve the problem. Fighters have to have a reason to fight at their natural weight. Adding 165 and 175 doesn't solve the problem. If you want to fight at 165, cool, be a small welterweight. I, before before you go, I don't think anyone is saying that this is going to solve the weight cutting problem. I don't think no. I don't think there's anyone saying that. Hey, as soon as you add that 165 pound weight class, magically everyone is going to stop cutting a ridiculous amount of weight. It's amazing. It's just going to be like, uh, voila! All of a sudden, no, the weight weight the weight cutting issue goes away. No, no one, absolutely no one is saying that. No, 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 no one's saying that. Also, it is very generous of Hefe O1 to to just allow people to oh cool be a small welterweight yeah that's very easy for you to say when you're not in there fighting dudes who are 200 pounds like come on uh no yeah it's not about solving the weight cutting problem it's just more about opening possibilities opening options right we saw this with the women's division where when it was 115 and 135 you saw a lot of women uh valerie Letourneau, jojo calderwood a lot of women were trying to cut down to 115 because they were too small for 135 it's just giving options now that we have 25 out there you have people making healthier cuts making healthier decisions living health healthier lifestyles 155 to 170 is too big of a jump in the most talent rich group in the entire sport for the men it's as simple as that i don't think it's anybody like mark said is just saying this is gonna fix the problem i think i think you could probably say somewhat scientifically maybe i may, or maybe i'm just making this up that most well, men kind of fall in the range most men kind of fall in the range of where you would be to cut to a 170 to 155, right? I think, is that is that is that fair to say? I would say that's probably fair to say, but also just in general, most athletes uh, of that size have nowhere else really to go with their skills, right? Like that's always been the thing where bigger dudes can go to the NFL, they can go in the NBA, they can play baseball. Smaller guys, there's not a lot of opportunities for a professional athletic career, so therefore... That's why we see a lot of these athletes turning to MMA and really populating these lower weight divisions. So, so, with, so with that being said, there are plenty of people uh, moving, to, you know, uh, cutting to those weight classes, and there are some fighters who legitimately are just stuck in the middle of of, of those two weight classes. Someone like a Drew Dober, who is not a very tall guy, so he 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 ha would have a a distinct disadvantage at 170 in, in many cases if he's fighting someone who is like six one six foot cutting down to 170 he's five eight at, probably at the most through dober and and he would have a hard time with the reach in that division which is why he is he doesn't want to move to 170 but he cuts a ton of weight to get to 155 a ton of weight someone like him would be a perfect fit for a 165 pound division because I mean, CSAC wanted him to move up because he he gained back from from 155 more than 18 uh, percent over 155. That's an enormous amount. That's more than 20 pounds gaining back, uh, almost 30 pounds gaining back from weigh in day to fight night. And CSAC wanted him to move up to 165. There, of course, is no 165 pound division in the UFC. But someone like him is a good example. Someone like James Vick is a good example where he cuts a ton of weight to get to 155 but he would be he would have probably a strength disadvantage at once at 170 what what, what fans don't want to appreciate i guess and, and not all fans of course is that fighters fighters are trying to put themselves in the give themselves the best chance to win no matter where no matter where they are and and they're willing to put their bodies through complete hell if they think they'll have a better chance to win because winning is the name of the game winning is how they keep their job in the ufc winning is how they make the most amount of money so that is that is worth noting. You know, it's I see I see all these all these fans comment when someone complains when Kevin Lee complains like 165. <laughs> oh, just move to welterweight. I mean, the dude the dude wants to wants to have a, success, a successful career in the UFC. He wants to make as much money as he possibly can. So moving to 170, he feels like he's going to be facing guys who are who are monsters who are who are walking around at 210 pounds, and he's obviously not doing that. And that would give him a, a less chance a, a lesser chance to win. That's all fighters are really trying to do. They're just trying to. They know fight. Everyone is cutting weight, and the reason why they are cutting weight is because everyone else is cutting weight. It's 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 a catch twenty two. Yeah, careful now. You come at the fans too hard. They're gonna get at you on Twitter once again, like we did. Let's get at me. Get at me. Let's bring it. Bring <laughs> it. <laughs> he said it, not me. 
Uh, but we've talked about 165 a lot, so let's move on. Uh, next question is we're going to do a little fantasy matchmaking uh, from BCG347, who just asked who would win these fantasy matchups. First up, Mark, let's make this quick because we have a lot left to get to. Uh, Rose Namajunas versus Antonina Shevchenko. I'm taking Rose in that. I feel like she's just Ant – Antonina may get there at some point, but she's just not experienced enough in MMA yet. I mean, that's that's a weird one because Shevchenko is not in that weight class. She's a uh, she's fighting at 25, and and she's even taller than than Valentina is. So it, it's a hard one for me to say because there's there, there would be a there wouldn't they, they wouldn't make the same weight unless Rose went to 125. So yeah, I, I was I, assuming this was going to be at 25. So yeah, I mean, I guess if Rose moves up, I I would, I would give her the edge, but Shevchenko would have a huge uh, reach and, and size advantage in that fight. So I I wouldn't rule that out, but. Uh, yeah, I mean Rose is, is the best one fifteen uh, pounder in the world, so I would have to give her at least at least an edge because of that. Yeah. Uh, next up, Chris Cyborg versus Kayla Harrison. I'm going Chris Cyborg, but I think in three years, two years, this could be a more uh, entertaining conversation because I don't feel like Kayla's there yet. She's still very very green in her MMA career, and she would be the first one to tell you that. Oh, uh, Cyborg, one hundred percent, and no doubt about it. And and I do agree that that is a fight. If Cyborg hangs around long enough in MMA, and I and I and I hope she will, that that is a premier fight down the road. Cyborg versus Harris, and that that's a big one. That's 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 one of the bigger fights I think in, in women's MMA if, if that could happen. Not not in 2018, not in 2019, maybe 2020, 2021. Yeah. So so this next one's a weird one. I'm not entirely sure which weight class this would be. I'm guessing 170. Uh, but my is this like in UFC two, like open the open weight. Yeah, this is uh, all is just it? open weight. It's whatever the hell we want to do, I guess. Uh, Mike Perry versus Zabit Magomed Sharipov, the beast. Uh, I guess moving up two weight classes. I I'll say Perry just because he's a one seventy and Zabit is a forty fiver, and just just on size alone, I'll I'll take Perry. What's weird is Zabit would probably be the taller fighter in this, despite being a featherweight. Uh, He'd be the taller fighter, but he would have fewer tattoos. True. Also true. Uh, yeah, Perry just for the size. And then last one, Du Hoi, du Hu, du Hoi Choi versus Cody Garbrandt. Uh, again, I'm guessing this is at 45. <laughs> this is a strange. <laughs> this is a strange list. I would. I would take. I would take. I would take Garbrandt. I. I. I, I think that he's still the more. He's still, to me, an, an, an elite level fighter. Although Choi can crack, and he'd be the bigger fighter, so it would be a dangerous fight for Garbrandt. But I, I would still take Garbrandt. See, I don't know. I think because when we released the uh, fight night weights, Garbrandt was like much smaller on fight night than I really expected. Like he seems like he could make flyweight pretty easily. So Choi is a legit featherweight. So I would take Choi just on size, but skill set wise, I would. I mean, if it was if they were somehow at 135, I would take Garbrandt. Garbrandt probably walks around at similar weight that than many UFC flyweights walk around that I would say. Yeah. Moving on from J S Davis four eight zero seven six. Making you work for it. <laughs> a lot, a lot of numbers on there. J, J S Davis uh, from the MMA fighting comments. Can you make any sense out of Malky Kawa's assertion that Jones basically snitched on himself? Wouldn't that basically be a confession? Yeah. Uh yeah, I mean that's a simple the simple answer to that and we'll open up to a broader discussion but yeah, I mean snitching uh and more of the rule, I guess the rule in in question the USADA clause in question uh in the UFC USADA policy is uh what's the wording exactly? Is it like substantial assi assistance? Exactly, substantial assistance and and that is is if you read the policy and and I got further clarif uh, clarification from USADA the other day, uh, it has to be. It has to be. If you're if you're going to provide substantial assistance to get a reduction of your suspension, which is what John Jones did, according to USADA, you have to cooperate with them on another case involving other people. Yeah, that, because that is if you're just talking about yourself, you're again just confessing to things you did. That's not helping them in any capacity. There se there seems to be there seems to be some confusion about what Jones camp thought USADA was going to write in that release and what and what they actually did right <laughs> and and no it's true and and I, and I don't know where the disconnect is there but it seems like you, you saw it as saying one thing and and jones camp is saying another thing uh 
I think I think that the, where where the confusion is is I think I think that what what Malky Ka was saying is that Jones is not out here saying like all these guys at Jackson Winker are shooting up steroids. I I, I think I think that's what he's trying to say. Uh, Jones is not snitching on his teammates. He's not out here saying like yo this guy in the back room in Albuquerque is is shooting up is 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 putting is putting a needle in his butt. I, I think that's what he's trying to say that Jones is not out here snitching on his teammates. But you saw this saying that Jones got his uh, since his uh, suspension uh, reduced by 30 months, which is, which is a big reduction because he is cooperating on another case, which can be another anti-doping case. It could be a criminal case. It could be any, any a number of those things. And he's cooperating and he has to continue to cooperate in this case, which could lead to a sanction or a, cr a criminal conviction or, or a criminal charge uh, if he wants to keep that 30-month reduction. Otherwise, if he stops cooperating, they will reinstate that initial I guess it would be a four year or, or, you know, three year plus suspension. Yeah. I think that last part is, is the most important, right? That he is currently cooperating, but also has to continue to like, this is not a thing that has already passed. Uh, their reaction to the, the whole situation was puzzling to me just because it felt like it had already kind of lost out of the news cycle. And then just by bringing it up repeatedly, you're just making people talk about whether or not John Jones is a snitch. And USADA is like definitively out here saying that he is offering assistance uh, and unless they're lying, like, well, you got to take them at their word, right? So the whole thing was curious for me for them to continue to perpetuate it. But I want to open up to a broader discussion about John Jones because one thing I've noticed now in the week since, I mean, we, that happened literally the day of our last show. So we didn't get a chance really to talk about it a lot. And you broke that story. And one thing I've noticed now is that, and maybe the biggest thing I've noticed coming out of this since that since last Wednesday is, you know, I've spoken to a lot of fighters off the record over the last seven days uh, since the news came out. And the thing that has struck me the most is the distrust of USADA that is kind of permeating around the sport right now is astounding to me at this point. Uh, and, and, and when I say astounding, I don't mean it's surprising because it's understandable if you're someone out from the outside just watching this, but it really has become a it, what seems to be a widely felt sentiment uh, around the fighters in this sport, just that they don't trust USADA in a way that maybe they did a year ago, two years ago. It seems obvious to fighters, at least again, the small sample size I've talked to, that you can now game the system, and not even now, but that you can, that it, the opportunity is there to game the system if you have the resources to drag this out and really fight it in a way that John Jones was able to fight it a couple times now, uh, which very few people actually have those resources in this sport. Fighters aren't making a lot of money. A lot of them have full-time jobs. Maybe 3% of UFC fighters have an actual, the the the, the wealth, the capital to, to fight this. Uh, and it, it's that distrust is really understandable to me. Man, like if you're Tom Lawler, who sits out two years just because he doesn't have really the means to fight this, if, what do you think? What do you have to think when you see John Jones on his second, his second outing get 15 months? Uh, Tom Lawler basically retired himself. If you're Leota Machida, who, who loses two years at the tail end of like his prime, prime earning years because of a diuretic that you took that is basically harmless, like how, what are you thinking right now when you see this? Yeah. And I guess you could also use Josh Barnett as an example too, where he had a great legal team and he took USADA to arbitration and he, and he, it took it took a long time, but he was able to get off without any kind of suspension. Although it did take probably too long, and it, it cost him a, a good amount of his career late in his career. So that's also unfortunate. It's what's interesting to me is that there are two there are two kind of like schools of thought when it comes to USADA and and specifically with this Jones decision. There's a school of thought that why is he only getting 15 months? He, you know, he this is he's a second time offender. He has a positive for a steroid. Anyone in his position would have gotten a much greater suspension. And people are saying, oh, USADA is favoring John Jones because of who he is in the sport, and what what his what his uh meaning is to the sport, how much money he can draw the UFC. That is that is one school of thought. The other school of thought that I've seen is the arbitrator came back and said, We don't think John Jones is really cheating. We, based on based on what we've seen from the pattern of his testing, we don't think he intentionally tried to cheat. And if if, uh, if that thing was in his system and it was, it really wasn't performance enhancing. That's pretty much what the arbitrator came back and said. So there are people who are saying, well, 
if if the arbitrator is saying we don't really think that John Jones was trying to cheat and the amount in the system was so small that it wasn't going to help him in the Daniel Cormier fight, then why is he even getting suspended for, for 15 months? So there is the John Jones should have been suspended longer people and the people who are saying John Jones should not have been suspended at all. So there it's a it's a it's a weird it's a weird time where I don't think anyone is happy with USADA on either side. Yeah. Also, I, I will. I think that's a great point, but I, I will. I want to add. I do wonder how this is going to actually affect Jones's standing with the fan base in general. That's going to be really interesting for me to see because, in the, in in a way, John Jones over the past four years ish, when all of this has really started, he's been Teflon Don in a way where all of this has bounced off him, and the fan base has really just embraced him regardless of what he does or or whatever you know sort of paths. He, he takes in this sport. Uh, he's been embraced at every turn, but I think being a snitch, at least so far, just in the way this has been portrayed, having this substantial assistance, uh, it feels different in a way that, it, I guess the, the label of it feels different in the way that the fan base is now treating it. I feel like I'm already seeing it online, a lot more negative reaction to this decision and since, since you know, in the past seven days since it's happened, than really uh reaction to any of his past deeds so i'm curious to see next time we do see him how he is viewed by the general public because it it feels like at some point right there's a tipping point where people just don't support you i don't know if this is it the the substantial assistance thing but it feels like it might be i think that when john jones returns he will it'll be the biggest drawing fight of his career possibly oh 100 because i think 100%. i think there is with all with all with all the stuff that's happened with all with all uh, uh, issues that have kept him out of the cage him being away from the octagon says to people we need to watch this guy while he's here this is this is the best fighter in the cage that anyone has ever seen he's the best guy ever this is this is the greatest of all time in the cage if he's going to be fighting we got to watch him because he hasn't fought in a year before that he, he had a, he had a you know year plus layoff what, we don't even know if he's gonna if he's gonna fight again after this. We better sit in front of our TV and watch John Jones because it's he, he's had a volatile life. Sure, we don't, know, we don't know we don't know what's next after this next fight. So he, if he's fighting Alexander Gustafsson, Dan Cormier, or or a mop in the corner, we're gonna be we're gonna be sitting our seats. We're gonna be paying for that pay per view because we have the chance to see John Jones fight, which is not an easy thing to come by at this point. A John Jones fight is 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 a kind of a scarce. Uh, uh, property. It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a premium brand at this point, a John Jones fight. So whoever he fights, it's going to be a really big fight next, I think. That's a great point that I hadn't even considered until you just said it, because you're right. At this point, seeing him fight, just the opportunity to see him compete feels like a scarce currency that people are going to just scoop up the moment they can. So that'll be interesting as well. Uh, I think regardless of who he fights, whether it's Gustafson or Daniel Cormier, it's going to be a big one. Uh, so let's move on. This one is for you, Mark. I want to start with you because they're referencing you. Experiencing the Connor Khabib press conference live, and this comes from Lucian on the MMA Fighting page. Best of weeks, he says, which is a great, which is a really nice greeting. Uh, if I was not mistaken, at least Honorable Mr. Ramondi, that's your new nickname, Mark. Well, the he, Honorable he's Mr. Already Ramondi. Mistaken if he's calling me Honorable. You are the new Honorable Mr. Ramondi. Uh, was at the mentioned press conference for Connor Khabib. And I was wondering, how did the atmosphere and the exchanges there feel when actually being there? And how do you feel when your fellow reporters begin to ask such fawning questions to McGregor like some of them did there? Uh, and before you even start, I just want to jump in. One of my favorite, least favorite, both moments of that press conference was at some point, I don't know who it was, uh, poor guy. I've been in, I've been at press conferences. It's, it's the lights are on you, whatever. I understand it. Before he even asked his questions, he was like, oh, I'm sorry, my hands are shaking. And it was just, it was very unfortunate. Uh, but what were, your, what were your thoughts in general on being there in that very bizarre environment? Yeah, it was it was unique because there was no fans. And that's the first time that I've been to a press conference like that. And the first time I think uh, many people have been to a press conference like that with McGregor, where there wasn't, there weren't fans for him to feed off of. So he would drop a line, a funny line, and there wouldn't really be a reaction from the press. Maybe there would be a very, a very tempered reaction, I guess you could say. There wasn't that raucous fan base to kind of root McGregor on. So it came off as weird. I thought, I thought he did 
as well as one could possibly do in that situation where he had to almost add his own laugh track in his head to <laughs> these things going on. It was, it was, it was very strange. It was very strange, but I thought that he kept it somehow kept his energy up despite the fact there was no energy to pull from the crowd, which has been one of his, his, his things. It's really been one of the things that he's, that he's been so good at. And uh, it was, it was, it was weird to witness live because of that, because there wasn't, I said on on the post show, our react show with with Chuck, that it was like watching a sitcom without a laugh track. It was just like it was just like silent. It was like where you're you're supposed to be inserting some kind of reaction into this from fans, a cheer, a laugh, something, a chant, anything, and that it wasn't there. Uh, so it was surreal in that way. I do understand why they didn't want that in in a public setting though, because it was there was a. a the level of intensity that it could it could have gotten to, if it had been in front of fans, uh, it it could have gotten a little frightening. And I think they were trying to do their best to kind of keep let some it of the, get frightening. Come on, look, they want they need to preserve this fight. They gotta they have to fight. We this this man went into a, a loading dock and threw a dolly at a bus and got arrested a few months ago. Like they need to preserve this fight. So I get why they didn't do it in front of fans because. If you if you make it private, if you make it for the media only, you can limit the amount of people that come in who may be part of McGregor's team, maybe maybe part of Nurmagomedov's team. You kind of keep it to a smaller guest list, and therefore you you limit the possibility of all hell breaking loose. And and I, I think that I know that people wanted to watch that in front of fans, and it would have been more entertaining. But we're gonna get we're gonna get that in Vegas. We're gonna get that in a few days. You know, we're gonna get that in in, uh, in a week. Uh, during fight week, a few days from the fight, we're going to get fans at the press conference. This one, I'm okay with being in a calmer environment without the possibility of something going horribly wrong. So I, 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 yeah. I don't know. I wasn't there, so maybe my perspective is skewed, but I disagree so much with you. Like, I, first thing first, like, it was interesting to me to see people's reactions coming out of that press conference, just online and coming from people who are there and people who just watched it. It really felt like it was one of those things where it, it you could tell what side you were, what side of the fence you were on, right? Whether you were Team Khabib or Team Connor, whoever whoever watched it, you you could pick out what you wanted, right? If you were Team Khabib, you could say that Connor looked unhinged, it was a bad look for him, and if you're Team Connor, you could say Connor owned that press conference, Connor just killed it, and it, it felt like no matter what side you are, you could really pick up that part of your narrative and carry it. Uh, and, and be right and really just feel like you're right. Uh, in my mind, though, it was such a such a missed opportunity, man. Like I had it was a fun press conference to watch, but it was also a very unusual and ultimately, I think, disappointing press conference to watch and not on anybody's part, because I am genuinely thoroughly impressed with what Conor McGregor was able to do to steer that level of energy and that level of a uh, frenetic just pace in a press conference, like you said, without a laugh track, without anybody to feed off it, in a place that is a as quiet as a church, is so effing hard. Like that is incredibly difficult, and I don't think anybody in the sport could have been able to do that in the way that he did it uh, last week. And I feel like, and I, this is probably an unpopular opinion gauged from what I see on, people saying about the press conference online, but if there was a crowd there. I think we would consider that a legendary press conference effort by Conor McGregor because that crowd would have been going ballistic from the beginning and all of his little shots, all of his little digs would have been received in much uh, more frenetic fashion. When, when, when you're ranting and raving to silence, it comes off in a very, 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 very different way than when you're ranting and raving to just delirium, people going crazy, hanging on your every word. At that point, I feel like, again, it would have been almost like a Toronto May Mac type of press conference where we're just watching this in awe of, of the energy that's building in this building. Uh, and at that point, by the time we had reached the, the stare down, like the energy would have been so pent up and just thoroughly exploding through that building. Uh, I, I feel like it was a missed opportunity. I know we're going to get one on fight week, but it's not the same, man. People are focused on fight week. People are cutting weight, especially Khabib. Uh, he'll be cutting a lot of weight. It's just not the same. That was the that was the moment. That was the moment to really have a crazy type of of environment, like you got with Connor and Aldo, like you got with Connor and Eddie, like you got with Connor and Nate in particular. Uh, and I feel like it was a missed opportunity. But 
That being said, it was it, it did stupid numbers. Like there were like 50,000 people watching it like three hours before it even started. Like it was <laughs> like, I don't even, people just bored at work waiting on the video to, to show up. It was, I think it was a sign of things to come obviously, but I will say I was a little disappointed with the not having the crowd there. It felt like that was that again, could have been a legend considered a legendary press conference. If there was a crowd there, maybe I'm just being selfish because I was actually able to, ask a good amount of questions and get a decent amount of real answers. Whereas sometimes in these press conferences, you ask a question and, and it's really just about a performance of the crowd, not actually answering the question. So maybe I'm being a little bit selfish in that regard, but I do, I do appreciate what you're saying. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I just don't want anything to happen before the fight. I'm just, I'm just, see, I want chaos. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a not, I'm not saying I don't want chaos. I'm just saying, I just want the fight to go off without a hitch. I don't want anything ridiculous to happen i don't want anyone to get arrested i don't want anyone to get banned i don't want anyone to get pulled from the fight i don't want the commission to step in i i want i want i, I man, want i want to see those guys fight at, at, you know on october 6th not on september 20th this is going to be such a big fight and such a money maker for the ufc that conor mcgregor to steal a line from our president would have to go out on broadway and just shoot someone for something for him to actually get taken out of this fight like it, 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 something outrageous would have to happen for this fight not to happen. I am all for chaos. I want as much chaos as possible. That's fun for me. I, I wish we would have gotten a little taste of that. But I will add before we move on. Holy shit, man! Does Conor McGregor do his research? Like going because I had to write a couple things from that press conference. And in the moment, it's easy. It's it, it's a very frenetic environment in the moment. Like you're you're following along. You're trying to report on it. You're you're kind of digesting it as it comes. When you go back and re-listen to some of the stuff he was saying, like and tr transcribe them out and just actually like digest them, like dude was bringing some serious heat and and he did his research to such a crazy degree that the past week we've been talking about geopolitical uh, situations around the world that I don't think anybody anticipated would come into play for this fight. Uh, it, it's Conor McGregor is a is a better journalist than some of those people who are asking questions <laughs> at that press conference. Hey man, he he pays attention. Uh, well, hey, we are running super low on time. We have I can't, a, I can't believe we've been talking for an hour and 10 minutes already. That's ridiculous. I'm stunned. We have a, a shitload of questions on Twitter. Uh, we got to try to rapid fire as many of those as we can because we, we have a, probably the most we've ever had on Twitter. So let's try to get this as quickly right, as let's possible. Go fast. fast. Uh, let's see. Bah, 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 bah. Uh, Mark, I'm going to throw this for one first at you while you look for one as well. This is coming from Eric Holdall who, loyal listener, writes, what outcome is the best for Bellator this weekend on Saturday? Still having two famous champions in two weight classes, meaning Rory loses, or having Rory become a two-division champion? What's a more interesting outcome, a better outcome for Bellator? Long-term, it's probably to have Musasi win, hold that belt, defend it, because if McDonald wins, he goes right into the welterweight tournament, and who knows when the middleweight title gets defended at that point. So I think... What's probably best for them is Musasi winning, but I think they'll probably e – either one, I think, will, ma will make a big splash, uh, whoever wins. So, But long-term, I think Musasi holding the belt and defending it often is still a better outcome. See, I, I disagree because I feel like if Rory is able to put on a dominant performance against Musasi and actually win that fight, he becomes such a bigger star for Bellator. And and Gegard is – like he told me, he's, at, he's nearing the end for himself. He's got maybe – two, three, four, five fights left, and then he's done. Rory's still young, man. If Rory could become a major, major star for them, I think that's a win they would take. I don't I don't disagree. Uh, from Mahir Noor, Noor, N-U-U-R, yeah, Mahir MMA from Twitter, is it possible that if Connor comes out to, of 229 unscathed, he headlines 230? Might be a stretch, but GSP was talking about being 180 something pounds. Connor versus GSP, winner gets their third UFC belt. Yeah. So I talked to George yesterday morning, uh, and he casually dropped in the first like five minutes of the conversation without me really even asking that he was 183 pounds, which is a lot lighter than a lot of current UFC lightweights. And I that's lighter than Khabib walks around at, uh, which I thought was very interesting. That being said, this. Connor's not turning around and fighting at UFC 230. That's not happening. No, there, there's not enough time to promote that fight. Wouldn't ma it wouldn't make sense. From Zuha on Twitter, 
with so much hatred between Habib and Connor, how difficult would it be for Herb Dean to separate them and ensure there are no <laughs> strikes after the end of each round and officiating in general in this fight? Not difficult. Nah, I think I think Herb Dean will be just fine. People people were upset. Oh, Herb Dean is is refereeing this fight. Okay, yeah, maybe he didn't have the best night uh, against CB Dalloway, but the guy's been in thousands of MMA fights, and ninety percent of the time he's fine. It's gonna be fine. Well, you know, I disagree with you. I have some thoughts on that, but I'll get to that at the end of our show. All right, cutting into, cutting into my thing here, but uh, you didn't know it's okay. Uh, the next one coming from Diddy Bop on twitter who wants who asks would i be a typical nate diaz fan to feel as though the ufc uh and cue ball who I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about dana white are trying to sabotage nate diaz to some extent with the mishandling of the ufc 230 main event they don't want nate moving the needle even if giving even if given main event they clearly don't want him there i don't i don't think that's really behind it at all I know that there have there's been issues for a long time between the UFC and Nate Diaz. That's pretty well publicized. But I, the UFC is always going to do what's best for their own bottom line, at least what they think is the best for their own bottom line. And if that means giving Nate Diaz a big spot, they'll they'll do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I don't know. I I'm conflicted on this because I I agree that the UFC just wants things to be successful at this point. They need stars. But they do have a long and contentious history with Nate Diaz, and I don't think they want Nate getting the upper hand in regards to negotiations and, and star power and things like that. So maybe there is a little bit, a little piece of that, uh, but it's hard to say without knowing for sure. Uh, let's move on. Next question coming from Andrew Hutchins, who writes, Some of the incoming casual fans who have no idea how good Khabib is may have only seen Mayweather, maybe Diaz too, and maybe Eddie Alvarez. Uh, he's talking about Conor McGregor fights, obviously. Could a loss here be real trouble for the Conor McGregor brand in mainstream eyes if it looks like he's losing more than winning? Wait, what? So he's basically saying a lot of fans, maybe new fans, have seen Conor lose to Floyd, lose to Diaz, and you know, and if he loses to Khabib at that point, like is is him losing repeatedly hurt his brand in general? I think, I think that, that I think that's the question. I I think that losing to Habib would hurt his brand a bit, but not. I don't think of it in the same way as as I would uh, Floyd Mayweather. Look, he was not he was not going to win that fight. Like uh, people people people, uh, you know, were were baited and and they bought into that whole that whole promotion. But he was never really going to win that fight. And and the Nate Diaz fight, he came back and he avenged that loss. So I don't, I don't, I would, I would take, I would throw both those things out. He's a much bigger name after beating Floyd Mayweather, right? So, I mean, substantial, I mean, uh, after fighting uh, Floyd Mayweather, he's a much bigger name after doing that fight. Um, he won before, he won just getting that fight. Even, even if he lost the fight, he won just getting that fight to be signed and, and for it to happen. So I don't, I don't, it would, would, would it be uh, losing to him hurt his brand a little bit? Certainly, but he's still going to be the biggest name in, in UFC history after, after uh, win or lose. Yeah, I mean, we've seen how he how he handled the loss to Nate Diaz. I feel like if there's no one more equipped in the UFC to handle a, a big time loss than Connor and, and still continue on with his brand being what it is at this point. Yeah. Should we move on to some more Twitter questions? If you got any, let's hit him. Chris from Twitter, let's say next July for International Fight Week, the UFC wants to hit 3 million pay-per-view buys. A, is that possible in today's pay-per-view climate? Who would be on that card? Love the chat, guys. Cheers. Who would be on International Fight Week next year is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Chris is asking... Connor, is Connor versus GSP. Connor versus GSP. That would be the one that could potentially hit 3 million. And it would need it would probably need other fights too. You'd need like Brock Lesnar on that card or something too. Uh, yeah, yeah. You need like a nice buffer in the co-main event. Yeah, Bruce or Michael. Well, how about they just fight? How about that? That's the <laughs> I'll Bruce, watch Bruce and Nate Diaz have some. How about Nate Diaz versus Bruce Buffer? I will also watch that. <laughs> Hashtag would watch. Uh, are we? Are we? Are we good? Or do you want to want to do some more? Uh, let's hit one more and then we'll get out of here. I just see, I just see a lot of, a lot of the same stuff that we've already, uh, we've already covered. 
A lot of people are, are curious about this 165 pound division. The interest is there. Strike while the iron's hot. It's certainly, it's certainly there. Last there's, there's a few there's a few questions uh, about uh, Conor McGregor bringing up some of the geopolitical stuff, uh, talking about Ali Abdelaziz's son Noah. That that was uh, there are a few questions about that. Uh, Dustin thoughts on uh, Conor McGregor bringing up Ali Abdelaziz's son. When confronted by Ali during the face-off at the UFC 229 press conference, someone also asking about uh, Mike Russell's reporting about Ali Abdelaziz. Yeah, man. Like I said, Connor does his research. He, he's going for the throat. Uh, and he, all's fair in love and war and in the fight game. He's, uh, I'm sure Team Khabib, Ali, all those guys are not happy with Connor right now. I'm sure they're not happy to have that be the narrative that people are talking about. Uh, well done by Connor. Yeah, I mean, I guess if, if if you guys didn't see uh at the end of the press conference after the uh, actually before the face off, McGregor was making sure that he had both of his belts, which neither of which he actually has at this point. He has them <laughs> physically, but he's not a champion in the UFC technically right now. So Ali Abdelaziz, Habib's manager, off to the side, shouted something like, Why why does he why does he have a belt? Why does he have two belts? Something along those lines, and and McGregor went back at him. So he called him a terrorist snitch and and said uh, something about Noah, which is uh, how is Noah, something along those lines about Ali Abdelaziz's son. It's all part of, of this mental warfare. He's, he's just trying to get under the skin of Habib and of, of Ali Abdelaziz, who, you know, both those guys. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like Habib was pretty stoic during the press conference. It's hard to say if anything really affected him, but this is part of, this is part of the mental warfare. This is part of the stuff, you know, it's obviously McGregor is reading things. He's obviously going on run. He's, he's obviously reading, you know, uh, Kareem Zidane's work about some of the geopolitical things going on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I didn't expect that. Put it that way. That was pretty, that was pretty surprising to hear that he would, that he would delve into that, that part of things. Yeah. Which by the way, McGregor, not, not so innocent himself. I think bloody elbow has a story today about, but McGreg McGregor's ties to some, you know, Irish organized crime. So it's look, it's the it's the fight, it's the fight game. It's it's a yeah. it's a weird and wacky world. Nobody in this sport is better at creating the narrative and driving their own neg narrative than Conor McGregor. And what he successfully did is for a week, people were talking about Ali Abdelaziz and all these connections that Khabib has and everything like that. He succeeded in what he was trying to do. Yeah, and I don't even know if he wants to drive the narrative as much as he wants to. He wants to bother them. He, he wants, wants to, to get, get under the skin. Yeah. Uh, well, it's hey. an, it's an ed I mean, it's an edge. It's, it's a legitimate edge that he carries into some fights where he has already gotten into the heads of, of his opponents, and that's that's a part that's almost as important of uh, to his game as as that left hand, honestly. Yeah, and that's one reason I know a lot of people always groan when GSP gets brought in the conversation, but Conor McGregor GSP, a press conference between those two would be the most bizarre thing I have ever seen. It would be like what Michael Bisping was trying to do to GSP on steroids. Like, I don't know that GSP is such a nice guy and he just doesn't want to do this, that it would be the weirdest dynamic to watch hit Conor try to like dissect verbally GSP and really get under his skin. Does, does uh, GSP have any skeletons in his closet that, that McGregor can, can dig up? <laughs> oh man uh well hey we have gone long basically so let's get out of here with the promo you want to go first or me i'll go first My, mine is short there there has been a i guess the 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 notion this year that maybe mma is on the downturn that ratings are down pay-per-view numbers are not as good as they have been in previous years but what i want to say now is that i feel like these next few months going to 2019 could be a really, really big part of getting MMA back on the upswing. And I mentioned Bellator and some of the fights they have coming up, and, and it seems like everything is going in a good direction for them with the zone, with this weekend, with you know, Fedor Chael, with the with their heavyweight tournament. PFL is is wrapping up at the end of the year. They have their playoffs coming up. But the UFC, they're in a position now where they have Obviously, McGregor Habib, which is going to be possibly the biggest fight in UFC history, that's going to do a massive number. Dana White is saying it's already trending for more than two million pay per view buys. Then they go right into MSG, which we don't know the main event yet, but traditionally that is a big card. It's going to get a lot of hype. Um, Nate Diaz is back. Um, that that's a big deal. And then after after that, John Jones is going to be back at some point in the next few months. 
You have you have DC versus Brock Lesnar coming up early next year. You have whoever Nate Diaz will fight after MSG. You have these people these these pieces coming back into the fold that will be very interesting. And I think 2019 could end up being if if 20 if 2018 was more like 2014. I can see 2019 being more like 2015 where it's kind of coming out of a little bit of a lull. The ESPN deal is here. I think it, that could be also a boon for the UFC, getting more attention on Sports Center, getting more attention on ESPN. I feel like although 2018 was not really one to write home about, especially the first eight, nine months of the year, I feel like going to 2019, the UFC is in much better shape than many people thought it would be um, just even a few weeks ago or, or a few months ago. Yeah, I mean, you didn't even mention Cyborg versus Nunes in there. There's a lot of them, man. And GSP potentially coming back like we just exactly, said. Exactly, exactly. GSP coming back. And I don't think Cyborg Nunes does a big number, and I and I still wonder if John Jones ends up in the main event of that card. And which would be, if you have John Jones against uh, Gustafsson plus Cyborg Nunes, then we're talking about three cards to end the year that could possibly do, certainly in the 700,000 or up range, depending on what happens with, with MSG, but it's going to, it's going to be a very, very good uh, end of the year. And I think with Brock Lesnar coming back, I, I, you know, maybe that's not his only fight. Maybe he fights again after DC. Maybe we get someone asked in the comments, what would be the, what would be the international fight week main event that could do 3 million buys? I don't know if it does 3 million buys, but John Jones versus Brock Lesnar would be a mega fight. Uh, it would be a mega fight. You you throw a few more fights on that card. There's there's th things are looking up right now. Put it put it that way. Yeah. No. Okay. John Jones versus Brock Lesnar would be a that would be a circus. I would like to see that. Uh, so so my promo. I mean, we you mentioned it just like ten minutes ago. Uh, but this is something I want to talk about. Just we talk about it all the time. Accountability with officials, right? Referees are human. They can make mistakes. We all understand this. It is a tough job. We ampl amplify the bad nights a hundred times more than the hundreds of good nights that they have. But her, nine, day, nine days ago, and again, you referenced this. Herb Dean refereed CB Dalloway's fight against Khalid uh, Murtazaliev at UFC Moscow. And to put it bluntly, it was basically the worst late stoppage I have seen in a major organization in quite a while. Uh, like it was legitimately frightening. It had me yelling at the TV, and I am sure I am not alone in that regard. Even Paul Felder, Dan Hardy were just outraged in the moment. I spoke to CB Dalloway yesterday. He had just got back to the United States. It was the first time he talked since the fight. My dog is freaking out behind me. Calm down, buddy. <laughs> not, not a fan of Herb Dean, your dog. I, apparently. Uh, it was the first time he has talked really since the fight. And I've seen a lot of people. It was weird in, in, when, in posting that article of CB talking about you know what he thought about Herb Dean's stoppage. He was not a fan, to say the least. And it was, I saw a lot of people saying that CB Dalloway should have tapped, uh, that he it was on his responsibility to tap. That's bizarre to me. Uh, that that response is bizarre to me. That makes no sense to me. He was in no position to understand what was going on. He was getting beat up for basically a minute and just sitting here eating all these punches. He's in no mind at that point to tap. That's why the referee is there to prevent something like that from happening. Take a step back and put yourself there, guys. Like by that point, CB Dalloway is long past the ability to be protect himself. He was relying on the referee, Herb Dean, to do it. And speaking to him, he almost felt betrayed by the fact that Herb didn't do anything. And, and not even that. At the end of the round, it took like 25 more seconds for in CB Dalloway saying he was done like four or five times to get anything to, to get the fight finished. Uh, CB said that he has a five-year-old daughter. And that these are the kind of nights that make him reconsider what he's doing, like make him actually think about what all of this is. And through all of this, again, I'm going off a of CBD's CBD, CB Dalloway's account. Uh, but he said Herb Dean never reached out to him, never attempted to talk to him or check on him afterwards. They didn't talk at all after that. There was no apology. Uh, in fact, nobody from the commission uh, or you know, in any capacity, anyone ever reached out to him other than a routine UFC type of email of is everyone doing okay type of post fight email. I mean, we at MMA fighting have tried to reach out to Herb Dean to speak to him, got nothing, nada. And now, basically, a week after this terrible call, again, a genuinely scary lapse of judgment. And again, he has done great work over and over again, but this one was a bad one. Herb Dean's now getting the most coveted assignment basically in the entire sport with Connor Khabib at 229. 
uh, and the world just keeps on moving. And I have no problem with Herb Dean getting this assignment. Like you just said, Bit with Big John out, he's basically the veteran. He's the guy. He's the number one guy for that job. Uh, but I would just love, love there to be some level of accountability at all. An acknowledgement, a statement, something, field some questions, something. Tell us what you were seeing. Because again, if any one of us failed at our jobs that badly, we would sure as hell have to uh, uh, deal with it, account for it. And we would sure as hell not get thrown back into the biggest opportunity available next without having made some kind of you know, amends for it. If you or I report something, let's say, egregiously wrong or, or, or make a terrible, say something terrible, we're not going to cover Conor McGregor versus Khabib without acknowledging what we did in some way. So just a little accountability. That's all I'm asking for. And I don't feel like that's asking a lot. Herb Dean, I'm sure he'll do fine in Conor versus Khabib main event. If you want to give him that spot, fine. But just a little accountability from the officials in this sport would go a long way. And I guess that's all I have to say. But it, I don't feel like that's too much to ask. It's fair points. And uh, I imagine that Herb Dean will probably have one of the big fights this weekend at, at Bellator in San Jose as well. So he'll he'll be he'll be right he'll be right there again. I mean, he he is he's kind of the guy that gets the big assignments with with uh, with Big John now doing commentary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, that, that wraps it up for us. This has been another edition of the A-Side Live Chat Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. It is always fun. You have some great questions today. Uh, like we said, this week, Mark, Casey, Esther, all the MMA fighting crew, they you guys are in San Jose. You're going to bring us a ton of goodies from Bellator 206. I cannot wait for that. And should, I, next- should, I, should I spin my laptop so you guys can see? Oh, yeah. There we go. This is what you need. They're just looking at me. You need to like. Make <laughs> there they are. There you go. The and team, the A team. And next week, next week, y'all. Next week, is Conor, <laughs> <laughs> next week is Conor McGregor versus Khabib. We will be in Las Vegas for that. Uh, we will get a live show going. Something we will let you guys know. Uh, in the meantime, replay of this one is going to be up on YouTube immediately. Up on SoundCloud later today. We'll tweet that out. Uh, and Stitcher, right, Esther? And Stitcher this week. We're on Stitcher. I didn't even know that. It, this, it just, it just, it, this just happened as the show was going on. We're going to be on Stitcher this week. We are slowly making progress. Slowly. Very point, slowly. Point 0.1% better every week. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, but, hey, in the meantime, thank you again so much, guys, for joining us. We love you all, y'all. We're going to we'll see you next time. Next time, I can't even. I'm just flubbing my words. Live, live the A side next week in Las Vegas, baby. Live. Yeah. Well, it's always live, but we're going to be together. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we need the ability to edit this because this has gone on way too long at this point. Love you guys. We'll talk to you next week. This has been the A side live chat for Mark Armandi. I am Sean O'Shotty. Thank you so much. Have a good week. Later. <laughs>